Welcome back. You're still watching Network Africa on Channels Television. Now, Ghanaian authorities do not appear to be willing to compromise when it comes to breaking the law. The authorities are making an example by suspending 22 junior judges accused of bribery after they were captured on video. The Judicial Council is also probing the conduct of 12 high court judges and several other court officials who had been mentioned in the video which was recorded by undercover agents. The situation came to light when an investigative journalist with a newspaper crusading guide released the video last week and petitioned President John Mahama and Chief Justice Georgina Wood to remove the judges from office. Now, just before we get the latest from Accra with Elton Broby, let's take a look at the provisions of the Ghanaian constitution when it comes to the issue of corruption, especially when it has to do with people in the public service, like what we saw with the judges. Now, we just have to, first of all, they're required, uh, all are required to, uh, designated public officials are supposed to declare their assets at the time of assumption of office during and after their term of office in the public service. They're also supposed to create an internal committee or a similar body mandated to establish a code of conduct and to monitor its implementation and also sensitize and train public officials on matters of ethics. Now, they're also supposed to develop disciplinary measures and investigation procedures in corruption and related offenses with a view to keeping up with technology and increase the efficiency of those responsible in this regard. They're also supposed to ensure transparency, equity, and efficiency in the management of tendering and hiring procedures in the public service. Subject to the provisions of domestic legislation, any immunity granted to public officials shall not be an obstacle to the investigation of allegations against and the prosecution of such officials. Elton Broby with Joy News joins us but he joins us from Accra. Elton, thank you very much for your time again on the program. You're welcome. Now, can you give us the latest on this case? Okay, uh, the latest, uh, I'm, 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 actually report, I'm actually speaking to you from the premises of the Supreme Court, where the Chief Justice Office is. We will reconnect with Elton Broby in just a moment, but for now, let's just check out what's happening in North Africa. Israel has reopened its embassy in Egypt four years after it was stormed by dozens of protesters in violence that led to the evacuation of the Israeli ambassador. The Israeli Foreign Ministry also said in a statement on Wednesday that its Director General Dore Gold had traveled to Cairo to rededicate the embassy. Israel's previous embassy in the upper stories of the Suti apartment block on the now Konorish dwarfed by business towers and luxury hotels was ransacked back in 2011 by a mob incensed at the crossfire killing of five Egyptian border guards by the Israeli army as it repelled a raid by Sinai Islamist insurgents. The inauguration of the embassy on Wednesday went unreported by Egyptian media. Well, we've got some more good news still coming in from Egypt, and authorities have announced that the lengthy ban on crowds at national team matches is being lifted. The sports minister, Khaled Abdel Aziz, hinted that the cancellation of the ban will take effect immediately. The development is a positive one, with Egypt's World Cup qualifying campaign kicking off in two months. Egypt will host either Sierra Leone or Chad in a World Cup qualifier sometime between November the 9th and the 17th. In addition, the Pharaohs will be hosting Nigeria and Chad in Africa Cup of Nations qualifying. The ban on supporters in stadiums began after 72 fans of Cairo Club in Al Akli were killed following a match against Al Masri in Port Said back in 2012, with only a limited number occasionally being allowed into select matches ever since. Well, joining us from Cairo is the Voice of America's Edward Yiranian. Edward, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure, Cynthia. I, I'd like to ask, first of all, what kinds of benefits do are we looking at for Egypt with this reopening of Israel's embassy? Uh, well, I think 
on the international scene, uh, Israel will, uh, Egypt hopes to uh, gain kudos with uh, a number of European countries, also uh, with the United States, um, most specifically with the U.S. Senate um, and the Congress, which are uh, Republican controlled, traditionally uh, have strong ties to Israel. Uh, I think there was some worry very recently about the U.S. pulling out the observer force, which is stationed along the border between the Sinai and uh, Israel. And perhaps uh, that was one of the reasons they were hoping to, um, you know, put pressure uh, on the U.S. government not to withdraw that observer force. What about the timing? Why is this happening now? Well, very specifically because it represents a milestone. Uh, it was four years ago that the embassy, Israeli embassy, closed uh, after being attacked and ransacked and the diplomats being rescued by the Egyptian commandos. Um, so I think it's got symbolic value more than anything else because um, Egypt uh, restored its uh, ties with Israel. It's, it put its ambassador back um, in Tel Aviv um, earlier this year. Now, Edward, why exactly? We're hearing that the reopening went unreported by Egyptian media. First of all, is that true? Uh, no, no, not at all. Um, it wasn't uh, the top item on the news store, the news um, on the TV stations, but certainly uh, it was in the uh, Ahram newspaper, which is Egypt's oldest um, in the Middle East news agency, the government's official news agency. Uh, it was in Masri al Yom, the uh, largest popular uh, selling daily here in Egypt. Um, so it, it was reported. Um, it was just not a, a major item, not the top news story. So, can we, at this point, would it be wrong to say that it was reported by government news agencies, but not private news agencies? Uh, you know, I think it's fair to say that uh, Israel is not very popular among many people. Um, it's probably more popular than some may think because, uh, you know, watching the crowd ransacking the Israeli embassy, you'd think that uh, that uh, Egypt doesn't like e uh, Israel at all. Uh, but I've heard a lot of people tell me that uh, they do um, appreciate Israel for various reasons, and they say that in private. And, uh, you know, it's easy to whip up a crowd, a frenzy, uh, when you have political parties that are pushing the, this crowd to react. And I think that's what happened four years ago. So this has nothing to do with the crackdown on the press? Uh, I really don't think so. Um, I suspect the press uh, would have reported whatever it wanted to report on a subject like that. I think they're mo more concerned about reporting about security in the Sinai and things like that. I think that's what uh, has a lot of people worried. And, uh, you know, there's been a lot of buzz in the media about how many people were arrested and this kind of thing and that kind of thing. And there's a lot of misinformation floating around. So I think um, that, that's got uh, both the government and the press um, on tenterhooks. Just before I let you go, I have to ask about the, the partial lift of the stadia ban. What, is, what exactly does the partial lift mean? I'd like you to explain that and also how Egyptians are reacting to this news, if they're reacting at all. Well, I think it's uh, football is a very popular sport here in Egypt, and the public, um, undoubtedly, from what I've heard, talking to people, uh, is pleased by this partial lifting of the ban. I don't think anyone really knows to what extent the ban will be lifted. I don't think even the government does. I, I think they're just going to play it by ear. Uh, there's been a tradition of uh, soccer hooligans being paid by various political parties to create violence, and uh, that goes back to the Mubarak era. It's not specific to modern times or the, this current uh, administration. So I, I think there's a worry that uh, people who want to disturb the peace in the country will use these soccer hooligans once again to do that. So they're waiting and seeing and playing it by ear. Well, Edward, as always, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us on Network Africa. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Glad to be on your show. The Voice of America's Edward Uranian reporting from Cairo. Still to come on Network Africa. It's World Suicide Prevention Day and various countries around the globe create awareness on suicide, which kills more than HIV and AIDS.